mean where the pastor, or the, it was a traditional church, so the pews were there, and the pastor had a button underneath the pew, but the front pew would just fold under, and everybody would move forward. And I was like, the guy who comes up with that is probably going to you know, make a lot of good, good churches, or a lot of pastors happy in good churches. So this morning, you ready to do church? Good, because this morning, that's the question. Because I was praying and thinking and, and, and going, Lord, what do you want to say to the people here this morning? Um, there was this question that immediately popped into my head. And for me, that's a sign or that's the Lord saying, I want you to dig into this. Now, this is a number, probably about a month and a half, two months ago. And so the question was, why church? And I went, okay, well that's an easy one, right? So here's what we're going to do this morning. I might, I don't, I'm trying to decide, should I get some volunteers? Does anybody, does everybody have like a pen or something to write on? You might need it this morning. So I brought some along. So Sim, I don't know if you want to come up and maybe you come up and just distribute a piece of paper and a pen to anybody who doesn't have it. And you may simply doodle on a piece of paper and a pen, and that's okay. Or you might actually use it to, to write some notes. But I want you to be prepared, because we're asking the question this morning, why church? Why do we come here? What is it all about? And I know I'm standing in front of a whole bunch of people that are experts. So I thought, we're going to learn together, um, and while they're distributing the piece of paper and pen, you can keep the pen, by the way, those are a gift from me to you, and, and if you want to bring it back, that's fine, but don't, don't knock yourself out if you leave the building and think, I stole a pen from Dave. It's okay, they're a gift, okay, so there you go, so you're, you're released that way. Um, so, so I was, in the last number of months, I've had this conversation in different contexts. And maybe you've had that too, where people say, so what are you doing? Where do you go to church? Or, you know, now that COVID is over and we're free to meet, like, what are you, what is your church doing? Or are you meeting in a church? Or, you know, those kind of questions. So, um, anybody had that, had those conversations yet? No, just me. Okay, well that's fine. So, the, the conversation has just kept coming up. And uh, I was sitting down next to someone that I appreciate immensely this week, and that question came up again. And I, you know, they had said, oh, during COVID, we went online and we watched a whole bunch of different stuff, but now we're feeling like, well, we're just thinking about what we really want to get out of church. Um, and one of the questions, and I want you to think about this, during COVID, what was the biggest thing that you missed about church? What was the biggest thing that, you know, when you thought of church, you went, oh, I missed that. Okay, so maybe you want to write that down. We're going to circle back around later. But why church? Um, so I'm having this conversation with this, with this gentleman. We had, um, well, let's just say he had a very strong opinion about what church should look like. And I had a strong opinion on what church should look like, too. And they weren't quite jiving. And so we had a, what I would call an animated conversation. Has anybody had an animated conversation recently? Yes, OK. Kind of gets the heart pumping a little bit. Usually it's with your spouse, um, or sometimes with your spouse, right? Well, we were having this animated conversation. But I'm halfway through the conversation, and I'm realizing, what is like, we both love Jesus. We both appreciate each other's faith. And yet here we are having this animated conversation about kind of what church should look like. Post-COVID, pre-COVID, post-war. Like, you know. And so I said, okay. So I came away from the conversation going, oh, this is another... I'm going to say peace as the Lord speaks to me. And as I was thinking in the scripture, get really clear about what does scripture say about the, uh, the, uh, what church is supposed to look like? And then, of course,
first, you know, having that conversation really kind of brought it to the forefront that we don't want to really argue with it, do we? We don't want to have those animated conversations. One of the elements of the church right in Acts, and that's where we're going to start today, is that they were in unity, that they came together in unity. So Acts chapter 2, we're not going to read the whole chapter, although you know, know I love doing that. I'm going to read some more today. But Acts chapter 2 is the beginning of the church. Not really, but kind of the, this is where the disciples, this is Pentecost, right, setting the stage. And this is where Jesus continues his ministry and his mission after his death by turning religion on its head. So when Jesus is alive, what is the biggest, I'm going to say, animated conversation that Jesus has? It's with the religious leaders, teaching them, you're doing church wrong. Like, there's things that, are, that don't line up. And, and it's framed, Jesus often framed it, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And so it, it was okay that Jesus had animated conversations and we have animated conversations. But Jesus is trying to say, there's something different than what you're doing now to the religious leaders of that time. He's saying some, there's, there's something different. There's something we need to do different. And so Acts 2, um, again, I'm going to read the whole thing. Um, and I have to put my glasses on because I'm not going to turn it over to that. So Acts 2, here's what we find. Day of Pentecost in the, the I want you to just take a moment and kind of put yourself back into what Jesus is seeing and where, where, what the disciples have experienced in terms of their church experience. So, before I read that, I just want to be set the stage. So, the, in, in Jesus' time, church was all about the temple. Everything was about the temple. That's where the presence of God abided. That's where the, the Levites and the priests and, and the worship happened. That's where it all happened. And, and yet, we know that God doesn't really change and that people were experiencing the presence of God, whether it was out with the sheep or whether it was, a, like they were experiencing God in other places. But when, when you thought church and you were a Jew living in Jesus' time and his disciples, they would have thought immediately Jerusalem, they would have thought immediately the temple, they would have thought immediately the hierarchy of the law and all of those things that they brought up. Now, I grew up in the Brethren tradition. And so, in other words, we went to church three times a day, or three times on Sunday. That was the that was the tradition. So two of those services, let's just say I didn't appreciate at the time. So there was the, the communion service, which was boring for a young man because you didn't really get to participate. And there wasn't any instruments, it was just a cappella. And now, I immensely appreciate it. But back then, I was like, hmm, not so fun, right? Um, Sunday school, that's what I lived for, right? That time where we got to go and hang out with kids and remember Jesus, that was the fun one. And then, Sunday evening, was, well, Sunday evening had some competition because there was the wonderful world of Disney, right? And then there was church, and, I, and Disney didn't end until 7 o'clock, and church started at 7, and it was 15 minutes to get there. So in the context, there was this competition for church, and so we always miss the best part of the wonderful world of Disney because it always happens at the end, and we'd be leaving. So I had to have some healing around that, but I'm good now. Right, so I'm good now. I like the evening service too. So this is the context. You may have grown up in a different church context or no church context. You may not have had any experience with church, or you may have grown up like me, three times on Sunday. Yes, there was a Wednesday prayer meeting, and thank goodness I didn't have to go at that time. And now I'm older and I appreciate it way more. So church for me was kind of this experience of 
show up regularly, pay your dues, invite your friends so they could do the same. And that was about it. That was the, the experience. And, I, and I'm going to project a little bit to the first century church. I think there was some of that going on in the first century church too, that it was like, come, you give your offering, your sacrifice, you do all of that stuff. There's, there's all of the stuff you do. Then you get home and you have your kids and you bring your kids along and they do the same thing. And Jesus says, after he dies, something, something new happens. The Holy Spirit comes. Acts 2 happens. And so we're going to jump in. Um, and this is Peter kind of explaining it for the first time in Acts 2. And again, we're not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to jump right in. And it says, and with many words, Peter, he warned them, and uh, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And here's where I want to highlight this morning. They devoted themselves, so this is the people who accepted the message of Jesus Christ. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to everyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were saved. So, here's the question. When we read that, a number of times it says that they were saved. So, again, you can write that down. Paper and just think about that. What are they being saved from? What are they being saved from? They've had church, they've had the temple, they've had the law, they've had, they've had, like they've had all of this stuff. What are they being saved from? That's not the question we're going to have answered together, by the way. I just thought I'd throw that in here good fun. So, so you can write that down. What? They being saved from. And how does church help with that? Because this begins the question of church. Next, next slide. Go to the next one. Yeah, here we go. So, you're going to help me. I give you the first one for free. So, when you think of church, one word, well, one word would you use to describe church? And I wrote up in there, encouragement. I think I spelled that right, that's a good, so good. So it's a place where I go to find encouragement. Okay, give me a word. Fellowship. Fellowship, good. Prayer. Prayer, good. Bible study. Bible study. Teaching. Teaching. Worship. Worship. The Lord. The Lord. Community. Come on. Might be one or two more. Family. University. I missed that. University. I missed that again. University. University. Okay, well, I don't know if it's university, but we'll take that. Okay, so hit the button a couple of times to see if we hit them all. Community, yep, we got that one. Meeting needs, okay. Experience, God, yeah. Safety, yeah. Training in righteousness, maybe teaching. Accountability, truth, and last one. Proclamation of Jesus. Okay. So we're going to be here all afternoon, and I say this most of the time that I preach here. If we were to tackle all of those, we would be here all afternoon. In fact, we spent probably a good part of our lives figuring out how all of those things. Those are the ones that I actually found scripture for. So, if we look at this. 
this, and I know you guys are in a little bit of a pastor search, and you've probably been asking some of these questions about what do we want our church to look like? What do we want the gathering house to look like? And, and I'm going to encourage, challenge for you leaders that are here, if it doesn't have all of these elements, then we want to incorporate some of those elements. We want to bring them in, right? So you may not be in the church that is known for training in righteousness. But I think everybody who comes here wants a little bit of training in righteousness somewhere along the way, right? So, so just as you look at those things, I'm going to leave them on as we talk about accountability to the truth. And we're going to talk about proclamation of Jesus Christ. Because these two are the core. These two are the, like if there's pillars that you, every church that proclaims the name of Jesus Christ needs to have those two. And my search for the scriptures seem to be the highest priority. So let's look at that. So because I love reading the scripture, Matthew chapter 16, if you've got your life.
And Simon Peter answered, no surprise there. Simon Peter is the guy who always answers, right? Simon Peter answered, and he said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates and the gates, oops, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be back in heaven, and whatever you loose in earth will be loosed in heaven. For then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Now I'm going to pause there, because some people interpret that scripture and say that Christ is going to build his church on Peter. And I just want to make it really clear that's not what Jesus is saying here. What Jesus is saying here is that he's building his church on the declaration that Peter made. And what was that declaration? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The declaration that Peter, Peter did a lot to establish the early church, no doubt about it. Not one person, not all of us. God builds his church. Jesus, Christ, and him alone. And I want to be really clear about this because this is a passage of scripture I've heard many times in all kinds of contexts, giving probably more honor to Peter than we should, but also taking away from why church? Why do we come here? We don't come here to honor Peter. We don't come here to honor me because I'm standing up here. We don't come here to honor someone else. We come here to declare Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's so key. It's so key. And as we come together as a group, when we do that, we want to, again, this keeps us accountable to the truth. It keeps us accountable to the main thing. Yes, we have Sunday schools. And yes, we got great worship. And yes, we, but if we are not declaring that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, then we're not doing church. Ooh, that's a little hard, right? That's a little hard. But it's the truth. This is what Jesus said. This is what God says all through Scripture. And this is what God, if we have an example in the religious leaders of Jesus' time who had all, they spent all their time studying Scripture, being in church, and they missed Jesus Christ. When he showed up in front of them, they missed it. They were the ones who should have been the most excited and the most, they are the ones who should have seen Jesus' birth and showed up, not the shepherds. But they missed it because they were not doing church. They weren't declaring Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. Now, interestingly enough, we're going to just read the end of that chapter. It says, from this time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Then Peter took him aside and rebuked him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should not happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, say, You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then be rewarded, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his 
feedback. So part, and I want to kind of close that part of accountability to the truth. When we do church, we just need to make sure that we're declaring Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. And I love the end of that chapter because Jesus gives insight to say, and this is the little idea of what it's going to look like when I come in my glory. You know, when I come and establish my kingdom here on earth. That's what it's going to look like. Okay, next. And we'll finish off with the proclamation of Jesus Christ. So when we get together as a congregation, as a church, as a people, we can keep each other accountable. And so if somebody challenges you on something and you're like, oh, I feel uncomfortable, much like my conversation with this animated conversation, I will say, right? It, this is sharp, iron sharpening iron. This is what the church, we need to, to, I need to humble myself and say, hmm, is there something that I'm not hearing? Is there something that I'm not experiencing in this conversation? Is there a different perspective? But then I obviously need to go back to scripture and go, so it's not about who's right and who's wrong. And so often, again, as we think about the religious leaders as an example, their mission was to say, well, I'm right and everybody else is wrong. And that's not what it is. For peace, my church, proclamation of Jesus. That's fine. That's what the church is. That, that's how we define it. All these other elements build into that. So we're going to turn to Hebrews 10 because I can't talk about um, I can't talk about what the church is like without quoting this verse. Does anybody know the verse I'm going to quote? Sorry? 10.25. Sure. 10.25 says um, well, we're going to read it in a minute. But, you know, this is the gathering together. It's like, don't for, forsake the gathering of the saints. And Again, I want to put that a little bit into the context for us. If I can get all of my viewers in place. Okay. Perfect. Okay, great. So I love this. I'm going to connect Peter, Jesus declaring to Peter. This is this declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the core piece of what we call the church. And I'm going to build my church on that proclamation. And then the writer in Hebrews is now writing to Jewish people who have great context for what church is supposed to look like. They know how many steps they're allowed to make on Sunday. They know uh, what feasts and festivals. They know what I get to bring a dove for this. And I've got a sin offering. I can this and so they have great context for church. They've had hundreds and hundreds of years to figure it out. And then the writer of Hebrews comes in and he says this. And I don't think I can, if I can get you just to, to imagine that you're Jewish. <laughs> can we do that? Imagine you're Jewish. You've grown up learning the Torah. You've grown up seeing church. You've made the so 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 you're so you're thinking, you think you know what church looks like. And then you've experienced Jesus Christ, and you've said, okay, there's something about this Jesus character. And then you hear the writer of the Hebrews writing this. And he says, for the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with, the, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year out over year, make those who approach perfect. Think about that for a minute. I'm a Jewish man who has been thinking that the reason I come to the temple every year to give sacrifices is so that my sins will be washed away. And the writer of the Hebrews is saying, no, 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 no. It's not, that's not really the way that it works. Um, you'll never be perfect. For then, 
uh, then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats take away any sins. Therefore, when Jesus came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you have no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I've come. In the volume of the book it is, is written of me to do your will, O God. Previously saying, and, saying, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire or had pleasure with them. And now the writer's quoting the Old Testament, um, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made a footstool, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified." But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us for after he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now, where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holies by the blood of Jesus Christ, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Let us all consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves as the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Okay, so that's a mouthful, isn't it? But I felt it was really important to read the mouthful because we so often just quote that last verse. But if we don't get the context to connect Peter's declaration that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and everything that the Israelites did, everything that they did around church, everything that they did around religion, In the Hebrews, he's now saying is fulfilled through that same declaration. And then he's saying, now we have something to celebrate. Because we actually, and again, foreign concept, for a Jewish man to dare enter the Holy of Holies. We get to enter into the presence of God through the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We get to do that, you and I. But if we were Jewish, I'm going to say maybe only one person out of this room might have decided to become a priest and got to experience that, right? To go into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was. Why church? We get to celebrate that, don't we? Tell me this is exciting for you as as for me as I'm reading this. As we do that, then all these other things flow out. Back in the, uh, when we go back to the Acts, we read one of the crazy things that happens was there were miracles, like crazy miracles that were still going on. That was the outflowing of 
the declaration of Jesus Christ being the Son of God. That was the Holy Spirit at work. That's what the writer of the Hebrews is talking about when he says, okay, now we've got the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth, to empower you. That's one outward manifestation that the church gets to do. It's a joy to see. The other is, uh, hit the next button. I think I put them up there. Hey, look at that. Ooh. I love it when the PowerPoint works, right? <laughs> Encouragement. When we get together, does this not change? That, wow, if I see somebody who's maybe, maybe I heard about them or, or inside or outside the church, that, that we get to go, hey, I, I want to encourage you not through what I have, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, does, it flows out. Safety. We can... This is a safe place, but we can also create those safe places in our house. We can create those safe places in our relationships. One of the key, key things when we look at the interaction of Jesus here on earth, he created safe places. This is the church. This is why church. We get to create those safe places through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Training in righteousness. Accountability to the truth, community, experiencing God, meeting needs, all of these things are an outflow of that one pillar that Peter said, that this is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And literally, in the context, within months, I'm going to say Jesus heads to Jerusalem, so within a short period of time, the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit comes, and now we get to be the church to bring the presence of God into every single relationship, whether it's when we're gathered here together and experience the worship that we did this morning, which was sweet, or whether it's what we're doing outside in the context of our own lives and our own jobs and, our, and what we do. So I want to leave you with that thought, that challenge. Maybe you've written some things down in your, that, on your piece of paper that define church that weren't on my list, that's okay. These were just some of the things that I found through Scripture. Um, I'm going to pray. I think there's another song, isn't there? Okay, so let's pray. Lord, again, what a gift it is to be able to come into your presence through the power and the work of the cross of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that today as we fill ourselves up together, with worship, with the word, with what you, what, what you want to plant in our hearts, that, Lord, as we leave here, that, uh, that declaration, the same declaration that came out of Peter's mouth through the unction of the Holy Spirit would be on our lips and in our hearts and minister and meet the people that we can rub shoulders with that need, so desperately need, to be saved. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We give you glory and honor in Christ's name. Amen.